So, um, our first uh, speaker today is uh, Sarah Galliano from uh, Joe Knight's uh, Joe Knight's Lab, and uh, she'll be telling, talking to us about uh, SNPs and, and how to prioritize them. Lots of SNPs and lots of prioritization. Take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for the nice introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me here today and having this opportunity to present all my latest research. So I know this title is very long, so I shortened it. So SNP prioritization using functional characteristics. There are two key terms here, bolded and yellow, and they both cover two different aspects. So SNP prioritization is looking at statistical association between genetic variants and those variants that predict physiological traits. So that's the stems. And then we have the functional characteristics, which are the biology, so the regulatory features in the DNA. So essentially, we're combining statistics and biology in this method. So I'm going to kind of give a little brief overview about some key terms you'll have to know. First of all, genetic variants. As in the title slide, we saw the word SNP, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a type of genetic variant. So on the screen here, we have a DNA sequence. Um, DNA is made up of A, G, C, and T, four nucleotides. And we're pretty much 99% identical. But at single base pairs, there might be a change. So where the asterisk is on the G, most people have a G. But in a few individuals, you might see another nucleotide, or a polymorphism. For instance, an A. And if we sample enough people, we might see a trend that all those who are unaffected have a G, and those who are affected, let's say with cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes, etc., they might have an A. If we gather enough people and do an association analysis and get a very small p-value of less than 5 times 10 to the negative 8, then this SNP can predict the traits. So, this is a plot from one of those association studies. On the y-axis, we have the negative log of the p-value, meaning that this really small, significant p-values are up high. So past that red line, those are all the SNPs. So each dot is a SNP, and all those SNPs are, are hits, or significant. In other words, they are causing the disease. But those SNPs don't explain all the heritability for complex diseases. And the idea is that some SNPs that are not significant might also be causal. So those are the SNPs in this so-called gray zone. Now, the question is, how can we prioritize those SNPs to determine which ones are causal, which ones we should follow up? And that's what my method is about. So the idea is to use ENCODE data, which are bi the biology, it's functional characteristics, the functional information. So a whole um, slew of papers came out a year ago suggesting that most of the DNA is not junk. It is regulatory and it is functional. So the next slide, I'm going to show an example of what I mean by that. So functional characteristics or these biological elements are they're beyond the DNA sequence. So here, for instance, is um, some chromatin, so chromosome, and this is the DNA swan hypersensitive site. So it is associated with the open chromosome structure. Because it's open chromosome, then transcription factors are more likely to bind, and you will get an increased product, which will um, have a downstream effect on a physiological trait and may cause disease. So the objective of this study is to develop a method to prioritize SNPs in the gray zone that are not yet significant based on the biology, so based on the functional characteristics. So essentially, we have our SNPs, our genetic variants, ranked by some kind of prior information from the association study, so SNPs 1 to 7 on the left. And then we do some kind of method and we get a new ranking. And in this case, SNP 3 looks like a probable candidate. So how do we do this ranking? So it's a Bayesian approach, and basically we have two base factors. 
one of them, the first one in blue, is the base factor for association, which is just derived from the p-value from the association analysis. So that's the statistics. And then we're going to combine that with the base factor that is derived from those functional characteristics. So again, combining the statistics association with the biology to determine a ranking on which SNPs we should follow up. So there are essentially two aims to do this. The first one is to actually identify which of the functional characteristics are important for predicting a causal or a hit SNP. And secondly, is to determine the probability for a SNP that it will be a hit or will be causal. So essentially, what we did is we took um, three common GWAS platforms, we looked at SNPs on those, and we identified which ones are GWAS hits by looking at the online GWAS catalog. So we had around 8,000 GWAS hit SNPs and a lot of GWAS SNPs in the arrays. Next, we're going to annotate those SNPs. So we're basically going to go through each one and say whether or not it has a particular functional characteristic. If it does, we give it a 1. If it doesn't, we give it a 0. However, we also give the SNP a 1 if it is highly correlated to a SNP that falls into a functional characteristic. So these are the characteristics that I looked at. Most of them are from the ENCODE project, which I previously showed. And so all the way from non-synonymous SNPs to transcription start sites. So there is a total of 14 here. But many of them have um, different tracks, so to say, if there are different cell types. So for instance, the DNA swine hypersensitive regions and some of the histone marks have many cell types that were interrogated. So it equals to a total of 543 functional characteristics. So here we have our big table with our SNPs going down and zeros and ones. Ones is that it has a functional characteristic characteristic and zero that it does not. So there's a total of 14 columns for our clumps analysis and 543 as I mentioned if we deal with the cell lines separately. So now we take this big table and we perform a fancy kind of um, logistic regression. So this is a machine learning approach called elastic nets and we're using this to determine the coefficients to be assigned to the functional characteristics. So now I'll explain the elastic net part. So we have our training set to determine our parameters of the model, and then we have our test set to ensure that the model is not overfit. So this is determining our parameters. On the lower axis, we have our lambda, which is our penalty. On the left, we have the lenient penalty, which is essentially equivalent to a ridge regression, where all the predictors are included in the model and then on the right, we have our stringent penalty, which is equivalent to a lasso type regression, where only the most important predictors are included. So our predictors on the top axis are our functional characteristics, such as the non-synonymous SNPs, the DNA one hypersensitive sites. And on the y-axis, we have our deviance. So we plot that, and our lowest deviance is way over at the linear penalty side, we're not going to pick the, the lowest one. We're actually going to pick the deviance that is one standard deviation from that to avoid the model being overfit. So now we determine our lambda at that um, um, set. And this goes to our first aim now of identifying which functional characteristics best identify the GWAS hits. So these are the same x axes as before. And at our y-axis, we have um, the coefficient. So this is the beta value assigned to each functional characteristic, so assigned to each predictor. So we're going to see a bunch of lines that are different colors, and each line represents a different functional characteristic. The higher the coefficient, the more important this characteristic is in predicting whether or not a SNP is causal. So here are our lines. And the dotted line represents the lambda value that we determined in the previous slide. So the red corresponds to the non-synonymous um, functional characteristic. So that one appears to be the most important in 
predicting a GWAS hit. So now that we have our model, does it work? And this goes into our second aim, which is determining the probability that a SNP is a hit or will be causal. So on our x-axis here, we have our predicted value from the model. The small predicted value is unlikely to be a hit, and the large predicted value means that the SNP is likely to be a hit. So I plotted non-hits in gray and the hits in black. So we want to see that a separation between the two classes. And we do, with the gray non-hits tending towards the lower predictive values and the hits tending towards the higher ones. So I also did the procedure again, but using a phenotype-specific approach. So instead of defining all uh, hits in the GWAS catalog, I used subsets, so I looked at brain-related, cardiovascular, autoimmune, and cancer hits, and repeated the procedure. So does that work? Well, yes and no. Autoimmune, on the left, we see a separation, so it works pretty well. Brain, not so much. It did not work very well. So the next steps here are to improve these predictions, especially for the brain-related traits. So one idea is to incorporate more functional characteristics. Specifically, those characteristics derive from brain data, brain tissue. So this can be from the Roadmap Epigenomics Project, for instance. Another way would be to refine the brain list. Instead of including all brain-related traits, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, etc., refine it to maybe just psychiatric disorders, for instance, and maybe we can get better predictions. So in conclusion, prioritizing SNPs using functional characteristics works. But there's still room for improvements. So if we have time, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. John, questions? Uh, you talked about this is uh, SNPs, so way more than that. Uh, if we're interested in semantic changes in cancer, how would you apply this? Well, that's a very good point. Um, Ideally, I guess um, your variant would just be another variable in the model. So you just kind of analyze it again. You would go through it and see, if, like say it's a CMB, for instance, you would go through and see if that CMB falls into any of the um, functional characteristic regions. So it doesn't have to be limited just to single nucleotide polymorphisms. So in the part of, in the brain, the brain plot you show that didn't really help. Yeah. But you were using the um, the annotation, the encode annotations all together, not by cell line. Uh, so yes. you were using the ones that are based on cell lines derived from the brain, you will... Right, that's right. So yeah, the plot that I showed, it is using the clumped analysis, uh -huh. so not by cell lines. So I did do this using all the 543 separately, uh -huh. and results were very similar. But a reason could be because ENCODE actually only has two brain yeah. tissues in them, and both of them are cancerous, so uh -huh. not a very good representation of the actual brain. And if you only use those two, what, the data for those two cell lines, if you only use that to prioritize um, They tissues? actually were not included for DNA's one hypersensitive sites or yeah. for the histomarks that I looked at. I my, but whatever is there, can you use only that set? Um, you can, but the idea is to to use all the predictors into the model and let it learn from the data and determine which ones are important. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Jeff, uh, would you have any idea what the area under the curve would be? Something yes. Like so the area under the curve for the brain was 51%. So the autoimmune was almost 75%. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so the functional characteristics data, it might not cover every uh, step, yep. right? So there'll be missing data in the matrix. How do you deal with that? Right. So essentially, um, if the yes, the data did not cover the region, then we would say we would give it a zero, saying that the SNP does not fall into that region because we don't know. But it might just be that it wasn't open. not covered. That's that's a good point. We didn't really take that into consideration. Other questions? Um, we have a special. Certificate of appreciation. Are you taking the program from there? Thank you.
about, and this is going to be